Hello, everyone. Welcome to this APP to APP talk about Lewy body dementia versus Alzheimer's disease, a clinical perspective. My name is Julia Wood, and I'm the Director of Professional and Community Education for the Lewy Body Dementia Association. Thank you so much for joining us. So we'll start with our learning objectives for this talk, and we hope by the end of this discussion, you will be able to define Lewy body dementia and explain how it is different from Alzheimer's disease. Also describe the symptom presentation of Lewy body dementia and how it differs from Alzheimer's disease. And then also be able to identify three possible multidisciplinary team members as referral sources to help with management of Lewy body dementia. So we often say at LBDA that Lewy body dementia is the most common form of dementia that you've never heard of. So you'll notice here under our umbrella of dementia that Lewy body dementia is second as far as progressive dementias only to Alzheimer's disease. So it's estimated that there's 1.4 million Americans living with this condition in the United States. You'll notice vascular dementia comes in at 20 to 30% in between, but is not a progressive form of dementia. And Lewy body dementia comes in at 10 to 25% of dementia cases. So there's some other statistics that you may find interesting as well. Lewy body dementia is the most often misdiagnosed form of dementia, and we'll talk about that more later. As I said, it's estimated that there are 1.4 million Americans affected, and these are mostly adults over the age of 50. It is the second most common cause of progressive dementia, as I mentioned, after Alzheimer's. And another statistic of interest is that studies indicate that Lewy body dementia is the most expensive form of dementia, and we'll talk about that more in the future as well. So how do we define Lewy body dementia? As I mentioned, it is considered a progressive brain disorder that features abnormal protein deposits that are called Lewy, Lewy bodies in the brain. And these deposits are named after the neurologist, Dr. Friedrich Lewy, who discovered them. And you'll notice under our umbrella at the bottom of the screen of Lewy body dementia, there are actually two types of dementia that fall under this category, Parkinson's disease dementia, and dementia with Lewy bodies. And the difference in the diagnosis of these two conditions is what we call the symptom, the timing of symptoms in the one year rule. So you'll notice here at the top, if we're considering Lewy body dementia or LBD, on the left-hand side of your screen, this includes Parkinson's disease dementia. And this is the development of dementia that occurs within the setting of well-established Parkinson's disease. So if someone has um, a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease or they've had movement changes with it for a, at least a year before the cognitive changes happen. When you contrast that to the right-hand side of the screen of dementia with Lewy bodies, the development of those cognitive symptoms happens at the same time or prior to the onset of those changes to their movement. And that would be considered dementia with Lewy bodies. So to further help distinguish this, if you're not confused enough by the alphabet soup, with Parkinson's disease, it always affects movement. And people with Parkinson's may have mild changes to their thinking, even at diagnosis. But we know that statistics um, suggest or research suggests that up to 50 to 80% of people with Parkinson's disease will go on to later develop dementia or PDD, Parkinson's disease dementia. In the case of dementia with Lewy bodies, it always impacts cognition. And individuals with DLB may have one or several other symptoms at diagnosis but they may not show obvious changes to their movement or Parkinsonism in the early stages of the disease. So in the case of dementia with Lewy bodies, in order for someone to be diagnosed with DLB, there must be enough cognitive decline to impair their daily activities, plus two of the following features. So you'll note here I've mentioned Parkinsonism, that slowness of movement or bradykinesia, the stiffness or rigidity, and shakiness or tremor. 
Also visual hallucinations are very common and these are often well-formed and complex and they can be of people and or animals. And we're going to talk more about that later. We often see even prior to onset of other symptoms, um, REM behavior sleep disorder in which someone acts out their dreams. And this can be decades before other symptoms actually present. And then another very unique and kind of hallmark feature are these cognitive fluctuations where you see significant changes in the level of alertness or arousal. The person they may seem very zoned out at times. But just to complicate and confuse matters, all of these symptoms can also occur in Parkinson's disease. And this is often what people are diagnosed with first is Parkinson's disease before the other symptoms present. So when receiving a diagnosis, as you can imagine, with this complex symptom presentation, it can be very difficult to get an accurate diagnosis. This study suggested that 66% of people required at least three physicians. We've heard even up to seven or 10 physicians to get an accurate diagnosis. 50% of these diagnoses took an average of 12 to 18 months. And it's important to note that 62% of the diagnosing physicians were neurologists and less than 10% of those diagnosed were by primary care providers. And then as I mentioned just a moment ago, 78% of people are often diagnosed with something else first, generally Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease. So let's talk about how these are different, right? Because often for so many people, when we say the word dementia, they think of it synonymously with Alzheimer's disease, but there are pretty significant differences even in the cognitive profile here. So you'll notice in the bar graph at the top of your screen, these are different cognitive measures or neuropsychiatric measures um, in people with Alzheimer's disease dementia. On the bottom graph, you'll notice those same measures comparing uh, the profile of people with dementia with Lewy bodies. So you'll notice at the top, people with Alzheimer's disease are much more impaired in those areas around memory, as I'm highlighting here in the red bars, and also in language. Now, if we compare that to the bottom, the people with dementia with Lewy bodies, notice that their memory is much higher, much better than those with Alzheimer's disease. But we definitely see in the yellow bars here, significant impairments to attention and executive function. And then also in these blue bars, the visuospatial measures as well. So the two diseases almost present in opposite fashion, which can make it really difficult for people trying to manage these conditions as well. Often strategies that work for someone with Alzheimer's disease may not work for someone with dementia with Lewy bodies. And from there, the changes even spread out more. So a significant area to be aware of are the visual cognitive skill deficits in Alzheimer's and Lewy body disease. And this study did a comparative analysis. So they found that the impairment in simple and higher order spatial and perceptual abilities in Lewy body dementia are much more severe and also appear earlier in the disease than those with Alzheimer's. Um, patients with dementia with Lewy bodies had more chances to get lost inside their home or outside their home, um, suggesting more training is needed and also more, um, address, uh, more need to address safety concerns as well. Patients with dementia with Lewy bodies also show more severe deficits on test of visuospatial skills, as you just saw a second ago in those graphs, but especially noting when it requires visual tracking and visual attention shifting. And we know that Lewy body dementia patients also display disproportionately severe impairments in attention, fluency, and visuospatial processing. And a big difference, as you noted in the previous graphs, are that, you know, our patients with DLB are often not as amnestic as people with Alzheimer's disease. So they're not going to have as many difficulties with memory and even object naming compared to their peers with Alzheimer's. 
And we see these greater deficits in visuospatial, visuoconstructural, and visuoperceptual deficits in those with DLB. So we really want to look at vision, how this impacts safety in the environment, and even um, doing things like daily activities of living um, can be impaired by their visual and visual perceptual skills. So now falls. This is another area that can be very common for people with DLB and also very concerning for safety and hospitalization. So when we compare falls um, for people with dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease, the onset of recurrent falling is much shorter for those with DLB than Parkinson's disease. And there's a far greater fall risk in a shorter latency period from the time of diagnosis to recurrent onset of falls in DLB compared to those with Alzheimer's disease. And this study found that those with Parkinson's disease dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies both have an increased falls risk and poorer scores on measures of gait and balance than those with Alzheimer's disease. And then more severe Parkinsonism, so those changes to movement are associated with increased falls in, in those with um, dementia with Lewy bodies. And we also see that abnormalities in gait and balance are correlated with increasing falls risk for those with dementia with Lewy bodies. So this really suggests the need for intervention by physical and occupational therapists, and we'll talk more about that later as well. So as you can imagine, this complexity of symptom presentation, falls, you know, potential injuries, hospitalizations. We also see issues when it comes to nursing home admission. So in this study, when they compared patients with mild Alzheimer's disease and those with DLB, men with DLB had the shortest time to nursing home admission by almost two years. And it also showed that the duration of symptoms prior to diagnosis with DLB and the use of antipsychotic medications were associated with an increased rate of nursing home admission. And then the worst part is once our people with dementia with Lewy bodies are admitted to a nursing home, these DLB patients have an increased mortality rate compared to Alzheimer's disease patients. So we want to try to manage them as best possible, as long as possible, and avoid placement if, if we can. There's often a concern for patients once they're in a nursing home being medicated appropriately due to a lack of provider knowledge about the disease and potential for complications with medications that we'll talk about later. And as you can imagine, all of this combines together to make this a very costly condition. Individuals with Lewy body dementia have more severe functional impairments than individuals with Alzheimer's disease, requiring need for assistance earlier on for things like activities of daily living. LBD is also associated with a higher mean annual direct healthcare cost than Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, and frontotemporal dementia. And it seems that these cost differences are driven mostly by hospitalizations. And LBD has higher annual costs associated than Alzheimer's disease related to falls, as we discussed a moment ago, urinary symptoms, depression, dehydration, anxiety, delirium and psychosis, orthostasis, and sleep disorders. We're gonna get more into all of these symptoms in a moment. So, the clinical features we've kind of discussed already. You'll notice here at the center, we have Lewy body dementia, and you can see around it this myriad of symptoms, cognition, neuropsychiatric and behavioral symptoms, autonomic features, sleep features, changes to movement or motor symptoms, and even sensory changes. So let's start with cognition. And as you saw in those graphs earlier, attention is a big area of issue. And also the, this often this mimics memory loss to people, especially with Lewy body. So they may come into your office and say, I'm having so many problems with my memory. But as we know, attention is really the mother of all cognitive domains. And so often the concentration challenges and the lack of attention is more of the problem with memory for people with LBD. 
We find too that people are often with LBD are often less aware of their surroundings, which can impact safety and cause more issues with falls. And they may not notice social cues from family and friends. And so this can be problematic sometimes as far as engaging socially. And at the bottom, when we look at executive function, people with Lewy body dementia have significant issues with planning tasks, also significant problems multitasking. And we see this with Parkinson's disease as well. So trying to do two things at once can become very, very difficult often making paid work a problem early on. Analytical skills often decline for people with LBD and they can present with more difficulty when they feel rushed or under pressure. And this can also cause a lot of problems with participation in paid work activities. So as you saw in those graphs earlier, where we compared um, LBD and, and Alzheimer's, the visuospatial skills are significantly an issue for people with this condition. They may have a reduced sense of distance between objects and have difficulty sensing direction. Um, this can sometimes um, result in people setting glasses or dishes too close to the edge of a counter and knocking them off and they become broken. It can impact things like driving, as you can imagine, and even navigating in the home or in the environment. And this can impact the visual system also and interfere with the ability to process and respond to information. So sometimes people can have double vision with LBD or even loss of color, color contrast. So following up with their annual eye exams, possibly seeing an ophthalmologist or even a neuro-ophthalmologist may be necessary. We also see changes to language with Lewy body dementia where people have more disorganized speech and difficulty with conversations. They may have trouble processing their words spoken. So as you can imagine, um, support services like speech language pathology may be very necessary. And we'll talk about that more. And there can be some apparent memory loss, but you will not see it as early in Lewy body dementia as in Alzheimer's. And as you saw in those graphs that compared the two conditions, it probably will not be as significant a change as the other cognitive domains. And this is the big one to be aware of. This one is so unique really to Parkinson's and these related conditions are these cognitive fluctuations. So frustrating sometimes for family, care partners, even doctors, because they may have showtime, these moments of clarity where they come into your office and they look great. And, and you know, you're like, what were all these calls from the care partner? What were you telling me is going on? They look fantastic. But this is very much a fluctuation. So they may have unexplained episodes of complete confusion or periods that they zone out and really seem very unclear. Um, and this can be accompanied by excessive daytime sleepiness as well. So it's important to note that what you see in front of you in the clinic may not be what the care partner is always witnessing in front of them. So let's talk a little bit about the sleep disorders. And as I mentioned earlier, that REM behavioral sleep disorder at the bottom is a very common hallmark, but there are other symptoms as well. Um, people may have difficulty um, following, falling asleep or staying asleep, so insomnia. Um, you may see restless leg syndrome where people have that um, irresistible urge to move that happens a lot of time in the nighttime hours and can impact sleep. And as I mentioned that, that uh, REM behavioral sleep disorder is a core clinical feature that is seen in up to 76% and can also, of uh, people with LBD, and can also be seen even 15 or 20 years prior to onset of the condition. And so the movement related symptoms or the Parkinsonism or Parkinsonian symptoms that we often talk about are that slow movement or bradykinesia Often their spontaneous movements or initiation of movement is impaired. You may see rigidity in the muscles and even in the flexors of the elbows and the knees where they're very stiff. Um, and all of this we know comes with a lot of issues with balance. And as I showed in that, that research article from Joza earlier, a lot of falls and repeated falls. Uh, when walking, they often become slow, their base of support becomes very narrow, and they may shuffle when they're walking. 
and that reduced foot clearance can sometimes contribute to tripping on rugs or pavement on the sidewalk, increasing that risk for falling. You may see myoclonus or those involuntary muscle jerks and twitches, and they may have tremors at rest or at action, but some people never have many of these features. And we may see what we call hypomemia or a decrease in facial expression where the face may look very masked. And this sometimes for family, especially maybe grandchildren or children can make the, um, the loved one seem um, non-responsive or angry or maybe looking disinterested. So this is important to educate the family about as well. And so unfortunately there's a whole host of autonomic features that can um, be incorporated as well. Um, early on is loss of smell, and we know this is one of the, the symptoms that we see often with Parkinson's disease. Um, they may have issues with temper temperature regulation where they feel cold all the time or maybe excessively hot or sweaty. Um, blood pressure control can become a problem with orthostatic hypotension or even sometimes supine hypertension. So the blood pressure may drop when standing or positioning, but then may be elevated when they're trying to lie down. Um, constipation is often a problem early on and throughout the condition, as well as urinary incontinence. We may see drooling and swallowing difficulties, even a runny or drippy nose. And then dizziness and lightheaded can be separate from that orthostatic hypotension or accompanying it. And I mentioned that abnormal sweating as well. So it's so important to make sure that our um, clients with LBD are aware of all of these symptoms, that they may not get all of them, but often people have symptoms that they have no idea may be related to their Lewy body dementia that they're really struggling with. But by far, hands down, the most disturbing symptoms for many families and care partners are these psychiatric and behavioral symptoms. So you'll notice here they can range from just depression and anxiety into apathy, but also into hallucinations, delusions, and illusions. And we're going to talk about those more now. So there can be a lot of simple hallucinations in Lewy body dementia. So they may be very vague instead of more um, exact in the description. Sometimes it's just a sense of presence. People will feel like there's someone just over their shoulder, or they may feel the presence of a deceased relative or a pet. There's a fantastic article um, by a neurologist at the Mayo Clinic um, called Twilight and Me, a Soliloquy, um, where he describes the, the sense of presence so well. And then sometimes people will see something more pass in their peripheral vision. This might be shapes of people or shadows, and it may even be an illusion because of some of the changes to oculomotor function and vision, sometimes people misperceive an actual object. So they may think there is a person standing there when it's actually a coat on a hanger, or they may think that there are images emerging from wallpaper or prints or patterns. So there can be a lot of variance in this symptom presentation. But we can also see more complex hallucinations in Lewy body dementia as well. And they're mostly visual in nature, but they may be auditory or olfactory or gustatory or even tactile. And there's some research that suggests that sometimes the auditory hallucinations actually serve as some type of a soundtrack almost for the visual hallucinations. So sometimes the hallucination presentations correlate and coincide. Um, these often occur early in the course of the disease. They may even be one of the first symptoms that people notice. Um, they may not be frightening, though, to those who are diagnosed. Um, often they're more upsetting to their care partners and family than they are to the individual. Typically, they're of little people or children or furry animals, things that are more benign, but sometimes people could have more scary hallucinations. When we talk about delusions, of course, these are those false fixed beliefs, and they will often be maintained despite any evidence to the contrary of their being true. And these can be several types we see. So they've kind of fallen into three categories, misidentification, paranoia, and abandonment. 
And so I'm not going to go through all of these common delusions, but I wanted you to have them and kind of see them. And I'm going to highlight some that are more common. Um, kept gra or kept grass delusion, depending on who you're talking to, is this thought that familiar people are identical or near identical imposters. I saw this at times with clients that I had where they thought that their um, spouse was their, um, had been replaced by their dead relative or, or was um, a, an imposter. It wasn't actually their spouse anymore. Um, they may have phantom border. This is a very common delusion as well, where they believe that there are other people living in their home, sometimes within furniture or within the walls. Um, and this can be very disturbing and upsetting. As I mentioned earlier, some of them are paranoid and jealousy is something that we see often. These delusions about spousal infidelity, um, worried or even convinced that their spouse is cheating on them. And sometimes they, they combine the phantom border and the Othello. So they'll think that the, the person that their loved one is cheating with is actually living in the home as a phantom border as well. Um, they may not recognize themselves at times in the mirror. Um, and they may even sometimes have um, delusions of insects or parasites that have infested either their home or, you know, their, their stool or, or something um, in their environment. And something that's very important to know about for you advanced practice providers are these reactions to medications that can be really unique. Um, people with Lewy body dementias can be very sensitive to medications. And the first one that you need to know about and really put on your radar is that some medications can cause a severe worsening of movement and a potential fatally, potentially fatal condition called NMS or neuroleptic malignant syndrome. This is typically your um, Haldol or Thrasidine. And so many times people may be admitted to the hospital and then maybe they're having a behavioral or a psychiatric episode and people give them Haldol and they can really become very, very ill and possibly um, not make it you know, out and, and not resolve those symptoms. But it's also important that even to note that some over-the-counter medications can cause complications. And typically these are medications that um, contain diphenhydramine. So you may wanna review different cold medicines or allergy or sleep medications with your client to make sure that nothing's going on that they could be reacting to. And then the, the body and you'll notice, just to complicate things more, we can see a double effect from some medications that people are often on. So carbidopa levodopa, which is typically used to manage those, those the Parkinsonism or those movement changes, um, has a potential risk for side effects or hallucinations. And something we hear a lot on our helpline is for people with Parkinson's disease who are on some of the time-released medications like Riteri, um, sometimes they really have trouble with hallucinations with that medication and those medications have to be adjusted. And then you'll note here too that antipsychotics that are used to treat hallucinations and symptoms can sometimes also increase confusion and Parkinsonism for people with Lewy body dementia. So anytime you give a new medication or note that your patient is on a new medication, it's very important to track their symptoms and see how they react to those medications because it can be surprising sometimes. So what is the current treatment strategy? Well, basically the goal is to improve quality of life. It's important to note in this talk, I'm not going into medications or drug management, but please know that many of these symptoms can be managed or reduced with medications and other therapies. But unfortunately, there are no treatments currently available to stop or slow the disease progression of Lewy body dementia but it does take a village. So with all of the different symptoms and the presentation, as you can imagine, there's a need for rehab therapies like OT, PT, and speech. Social work is necessary often for family to be able to find the resources and support that they so desperately need. And we know that counseling can be very helpful, both for care partners and for the person living with Louie to help them find coping strategies for living with this very complex and frustrating condition. 
So I wanted to go a little bit deeper into therapy because what we hear so often is that either clinicians never refer people with Lewy body dementia to therapies because they think there's nothing that can be done or um, sometimes, you know, people don't go to therapy or they go to therapy and the therapist is not aware of what they can do. So you'll notice here in this study by Melissa Armstrong that there are no formal studies that have looked at this time at the impact of therapy for individuals with dementia with Lewy body. But when you think back to all of those symptoms that we've discussed, PT, OT, and speech can really be beneficial for things like swallowing evalu evaluations, looking at safety with mobility, addressing fall risk and preventing falls, identifying resources that can be helpful to assist in daily function, things like, you know, um, grab bars and bedside commodes or bed rails, and then also addressing any changes to swallowing. So we're going to look a little bit more, talk a little bit more about what PT can do. So as you can imagine, they really work to promote that increased functional independence safely in daily activities. They're gonna also focus on specific physical activities that are enjoyable and meaningful to that individual while also working to address their fall risk and promote a sense of purpose. They're gonna to work to maintain the individual's current abilities while they slow down, hopefully the rate of further functional decline in their movement and activities. And then also with that rigidity and stiffness, they're going to try to promote improved flexibility and work to prevent the risks of muscle, muscle contractions that can really be problematic as the disease progresses. They're going to practice task-specific activities like getting in and out of a chair or getting in and out of the bed or the car to make sure that that person is as safe and independent as possible. They can also work to teach pressure relief strategies later within the disease to promote skin integrity. And then they also are going to provide an assessment for an assisted device to make sure that that individual has the device that will be most safe and effective for them. And I have to tell you, I was in a support group recently where they talked about most of the people in there had not gone to physical therapy, but they tried to go to martial arts to, quote, learn how to fall which as you can imagine is probably not the safest or best idea when we consider the cognitive presentations. So it's really important to discuss the role of therapies and all the things that they can do with your client and how important it is for them to go and see therapists and get treatment. When it comes to occupational therapy, tooting my own profession's horn here a little bit, um, there was a systematic review done by Bennett et al. in 2019 of just the benefits of occupational therapy in dementia. And what they showed was that OT was actually more effective than usual care um, for improving overall activities of daily living. And as I mentioned earlier, the functional impairments around Lewy body dementia happen early on. So it's really important to get your clients into occupational therapy as soon as possible. They also noted in this study that there were fewer behavioral or psychological symptoms in people with dementia in the OT group compared to those usual care groups. And this is because as occupational therapists, we really work to keep that person engaged in things that are meaningful and help them maintain a sense of purpose. OT also resulted in a better quality of life for people with dementia than in control groups. And as I mentioned, that's really our number one target. Care partners also reported fewer hours doing things for the person with dementia when their loved one was getting occupational therapy. So we can help reduce that care partner burden that can be so prevalent for our folks with dementia. And then care partners in the occupational therapy groups also reported less distress and upset with those behaviors or symptoms. So once again, really helping to alleviate some of that care partner burden. And in addition, there was also improvement to the care partner's quality of life following these occupational th therapy interventions. So we really can help to improve the quality of life of that dyad, the individual living with Lewy body dementia and their care partner. So let's talk now about how our speech language colleagues can help because they really do play a central role in screening, assessing, and diagnosing different treatment for people with dementia. So they can really work to screen individuals with these cognitive communication difficulties, much like we do in occupational therapy, looking at more levels of functional cognition. 
they also are going to take this into consideration in a cultural and linguistically relevant assessment to make sure that they're addressing um, communication function and swallowing in ways that are meaningful and relevant to that individual. They're going to assess, diagnose, and treat associated swallowing disorders. And these can be very common and happen early on for people with Lewy body dementia. They're going to counsel individuals with dementia and their family regarding these communication related issues and give them information about the nature of Lewy body dementia and its ultimate course. Their treatment plans can be to ultimately maintain those cognitive and communication functional abilities at the highest level throughout the underlying condition. And often this happens more through indirect interventions, working with the caregivers for the individual and working to also provide education in needs for environmental modification. So for all of these therapies, and I think whoever we are within the care team, we want to focus on these preserved strengths for these individuals with Lewy body dementia, not just looking at what is lost or what has changed. So can we keep them independent doing a task or activity? Do we maybe need to look at some accommodations or do they need assistance? And if they need assistance, what is kind of the lowest level of assistance we could, could train the care partner or those paid home health aides to do so that they're doing the most and really staying engaged in daily activities? So some take home points that I hope that you've gained from this talk. Having a diagnosis of Lewy body dementia helps provide clarity for families and also supports best management and best treatment. So it is important that we give that differential diagnosis or refer out so that people can get an accurate and clear diagnosis of the type of dementia that they have. Once they've got the diagnosis, we want to create a personalized action plan that's going to include not only medications and drugs, but also non-drug approaches like therapy and exercise. We want to help them establish a care team. You know, it really does take a village when we're working with a condition as complex as Lewy body dementia. We also want to make sure to provide support and resources for the family to help them best cope with all of the challenging symptoms and, um, and challenges along the way. And then we want to encourage physical and mental activities while being mindful of safety for these individuals. We want to keep them engaged and, and working and, and, and out in the community, socializing and living their life with purpose and meaning as much as possible. So I just want to leave you with some resources that we may be able to help provide you for it so you can support your constituents and your patients with Lewy body dementia. As you're getting education here, we also have a lot of publications for the community and professionals that you can go to our website and order or download. We also are setting up currently a learning management system that will have educational resources for the community and for healthcare professionals. And additional education resources can be found at mediflix.com. Our downloadable materials will maybe fill in some of the gaps from this talk. If you're looking for a medication glossary, we have a wonderful diagnostic symptom checklist. So you can go to our website and download those materials free anytime you need. We also work to build awareness. So if you would like to educate your colleagues or your community to understand more about Lewy body dementia, we have an amazing educational tool a film called Spark, Robin Williams and his battle with Lewy body dementia that really tells the story of Robin Williams and his experience with Lewy body and all of the challenges that we've talked about throughout this presentation are highlighted within this um, educational yet entertaining and informative film. So it's available, available from LBDA for you to do community outreach events, um, healthcare professional education, or even joint fundraising events with us. And it's also available now on Mediflix if you would like to check out the film. 
And we have supporting resources available at Lewy Body Dementia Association to help with um, establishing your event, planning your event, and even promoting and marketing it to your community. It's important to note too that we offer support for your patients. Also for you, if you have any questions, you can call our Louie line at 1-800-539-9767 or support at lbda.org. Um, for people living within the United States, we have Facebook support groups, both for those living with Louie and for care partners. And we have virtual and community-based support groups that are led by community and professional volunteers who have been at trained by the Lewy Body Dementia Association. Our research centers of excellence are a great place to find different clinical trials, educational programs, or even um, possibly referral sources for you. This was a grant program that we launched in 2017 that highlights 22 centers in the US with clinical expertise and clinical trial experience. The, the role and hope of these centers is to increase access to high quality clinical care, establish a clinical trials ready network, and you can go to our website to see what clinical trials are available to refer to your clients. Also increase access to support in these areas and increase knowledge of Lewy body dementia among medical professionals like yourselves. We also hope to create an infrastructure and resources to advance more research. We need so much more to better understand Lewy body dementia. And I wanna leave you with this quote today um, from a gentleman named Michael Belleville who is living with Lewy body dementia. People who've been given this diagnosis can still contribute, learn and live a meaningful life. They also still have a voice, even if they may have difficulty communicating the way they could before. So please remember when you encounter someone with any form of dementia, that it is a disease and not a personality trait. I thank you all so much for your time and attention. You can find us at lbda.org if you have any requests, questions, or need resources, we're here for you. Thank you so much for your time and attention.